Welcome back to the library, dear wanderer. I am familiar with our little routine now. Pay no mind to the others in the shelves. It is a slow day, and all the patrons are looking for a story to delve into. They will not bother the chief archivist and his guest. Come, walk with me. I will take you to our spot, and regale you with some of the tomes of the library while you rest. Ramblings of a Retired Tramp by El Jodidian We're too quick to throw things away. Take this Mack truck, for instance, sitting in the middle of nowhere, rural Sonoma County. From the style of the cab alone, I guess it was made in the 1970s. Come take a look, the dust, pollen, and mold won't kill you. The seat's got springs coming out through the stuffing, but there's nothing a little bit of thread and fabric couldn't fix. Windshield's shot, but what else? The steering column? Still could work fine for what it is. Tires? They look a bit sad, but still could work. Engine? Heck, if I had the right tools or something to tow it with, I could take it over to the elderly Vietnamese mechanic down in Santa Rosa and pay to have it refitted with a working one from their spread of salvaged trucks out back. See, this is what I'm talking about. I can't imagine why someone would abandon this machine, still with parts worth saving, all the way out here, way beyond the highway, and just leave it here to die. I'm sick of this world, throwing away good things that still clearly work. Anything could be fixed, even the floor pan. Yeah, my boots are going clear through to the sprigs of weeds below, but imagine if someone welded a steel plate over this. Boom. Fixed. What do you mean that it wouldn't last long? You have to find a way to make it last long. Hey. I found documents in the dash. This Mac used to belong to a place called Penderson and Sons Trucking out of San Francisco. Trucking. That reminds me of the first time I ever hit the road, way back in 1988. Eighteen years old, just graduated from high school and I had no clue what I was doing, except that I needed to get to McKinville, way up in Oregon to work at a counselor at a Boy Scout camp. Back then, I was straight up broke, and my parents wouldn't even cough up the money for a Greyhound ticket, so I had no choice but to hitchhike. There I stood, on the side of Interstate 5, looking like a goddamn idiot, sticking out my thumb, watching semi-trucks and station wagons whip by, hard and fast. It took me one hour of just standing there, feeling my legs go weak before I realized there was no shoulder for anyone to pull over. Turned out that didn't matter, because a cream semi-truck with British Columbian tags slowed down just long enough for the driver to shout a message. Hop in, son! Cigarette dangling in his mouth, those aviator shades refracting the light that came in through the rolled-down cab window. You could hardly tell that he was a family man, if it wasn't for his daughter, a girl about six, seven or so, playing with a she-ra doll in the back. He was asking me the usual questions, name, if I wanted to go further beyond McMinnville, my old high school. Yeah, for the whole ride I dropped my entire life story in bits and pieces, like breadcrumbs in a fairy tale. My own father would never do that to a complete stranger, he would cut them off and shut their soul down with a single sentence of scorn. Turns out the trucker and his daughter had just run a long distance haul down to San Diego and were heading home to Vancouver back across the border. His wife, he said, well, they were divorced. Why, exactly? I blurted out. He took it in stride. She's addicted, son. My ex-wife, I mean, he told me. Addicted to pills. The nasty kind where they force your entire system wide awake and you flail out without any control. She would go to rehab and come out unchanged, leading to little things that added up to that night coming home to see her sprawled out on the carpet, frothing at the mouth, and she would swing at me when I tried to help her. Dinner is always going uncooked, and me having to do everything by myself. Finally, I had to send my daughter, Evelyn, to live with my own father and mother for the weekends when I was out of town on business trips. Then that evening back in 87, Evelyn was attacked by her. She tried to kill her daughter, my daughter, grabbed a kitchen knife and tried to kill my daughter before the cops showed up. I glanced back at Evelyn. She had stopped playing and just sat still on the sleeper bed, 
watching us talk. And I swear to God, that kid, she had a scar that ran the entire length of her arm. Of course, it had healed just enough that if you were passing by, you wouldn't have caught it, but it was there. One long, jagged, crimson line across skin. My stomach dropped a little when I saw that. How could it be that the mother was so quick to throw away her own daughter? That's why I took up part-time trucking, he said, as we drove on around tight turns, the forests situated on the slopes of the high snow-capped pinnacles looming ever larger, pines growing taller, more clustered, all packed in the constant layer of mist that hung under the perpetual slate-gray skies of the Cascades. If you really think about it, son, I couldn't let the memories of her go. I simply couldn't. I have the burden to keep them alive, to tell my daughter rather than let her forget and grow up clueless. I will never forget the sound of him taking a long, quiet drag as we rounded the corner. His eyes had changed behind those aviators from the loose, casual look that he gave to me to one fixated directly on the road, as if wishing his attention to the road would get him to the destination sooner. God. What happened to those people? People like the British Columbian truck driver. Oh sure, there's still folks around willing to lend a hand, but nowadays the majority only seem to do it for something in return. Yeah, yeah, I guess you can say that the truck driver would, could have easily blown past me and I would have walked back into woodland with my tail in between my legs. But he didn't. What is it that made him stop to pick me up? To be honest, I struggle to find an answer to such a question. I'm tempted to say that it was from the bottom of his heart, as cheesy as that sounds, but that's probably not the right answer to that. Maybe it was the love that he felt for that kid standing on the side of the highway. Maybe because I reminded him of some old friend, or maybe reminding him of himself when he was a teenager and took the road to get places. Or maybe it's something else completely. But one thing is for certain. He dropped me off at McMinnville with a beaming smile on his face, as if he was watching me go off to school for the first time like I was his own son. I didn't hit the road after that, not initially at least. When the week at the scout camp concluded, the camp bought me a Greyhound ticket home. My mind was too wrapped up in all the stuff that had happened there. Capture the flag games, merit badges, that sort of stuff. So much that I forgot about the truck driver and his daughter. It didn't mean that they were gone, mind you, just at the back of my mind, untouched. Soon after I got home, still in June of 88, I met a girl, Deborah, I believe she was. We had a bunch of things in common. She read books, was well-spoken, and had a penchant for saying how much she helped out the poor at her church. By those standards, you could say I had it set for something meaningful, if it wasn't for our lunch date together took her out to Richardson's, an inexpensive but lovely 50s holdout of a diner halfway across town, on the other side of the Southern Pacific Railroad tracks. It went well, all things considered, for a date put on by my dummy 18-year-old self. Talked about all sorts of things, mostly things that happened in our old high school. I paid for both of our meals, burgers, french fries as I recall. She didn't finish hers, so she took it with her on the go. We walk out the door, and on the corner there's a homeless guy who's asking folks for food. What few folks were out on that afternoon were ignoring him. He approaches us, his face stretched wide in the biggest toothless grin under that graying beard, and says, Hey, you two. I feel guilty about begging for food, but I just hopped off a freight and I got nothing on me to buy lunch. I see there that you have a takeout bag from that restaurant. I follow his eyes, and what do you know, they're looking at her takeout bag from Richardson's. Deborah, why don't you give it to the guy? I said to her. He looks like he needs it more. I'll buy you something else later. No, he's a drug addict. He doesn't deserve to eat, she replied. And before I could stop her, she tossed her to-go lunch on a nearby trash can. By toss, I mean she opened the bag and dropped the food directly in and then mixed it into the nasty gunk and rotting juices that were in there with her bare hands until it was inedible. For the record, the guy wasn't on drugs, and he saw the whole thing, his eyes wide open, blazing with hurt, 
anguish at seeing that good food go to waste, and she was laughing. Laughing. For what, I don't know. I wouldn't have wound up here, sitting in that dusty cab of a dead Mac in Sonoma, if I didn't feel what I felt and didn't do what I did next. I saw red. There's no other way to say it. The homeless guy was still standing there, frozen like a deer in the headlights, paralyzed, like I imagined the trucker's daughter, Evelyn, on that fateful night when she felt her mother's hate slash through her arm. Her laugh, cruel, full of malice, like I imagined the truck driver's ex. It wasn't charming anymore, I felt sick and angry. Sick and angry. All I could say at that moment, when that dropped, was, I don't like you anymore. I felt myself reach down into my wallet and take out a dollar bill. With the shaking hands, I handed it to the guy. Next thing I know, I'm pounding the pavement, dashing home. My Boy Scout backpack was still there, still loaded with all the goodies meant to go camping. I needed to run. Run somewhere far out of town, live out there on my own for a few days to reflect and come back as some sort of changed guy. I don't know what I was even thinking during that time. I took my backpack and decided to raid the pantry and kitchen for food. Grabbed spam, vegetables, the can opener, dry noodles, and shoved it all in the pack. I heard a voice behind me. It was my father. What the hell are you doing taking food out of the cupboards? He barked at me. I thought you were on a date with Deborah. Not anymore. You're an idiot. A goddamn idiot for treating a woman like that. I busted out the back door and my father took off after me. Past a few houses I could hear his labored breathing growing fainter and then fall away as I neared the end of that block. But even then, I still ran. I'm not ashamed to say it. I kept on running. Eventually, I ran so far that I reached the railroad tracks, but when I stopped to rest, my father crashed through the bush behind me. He hadn't given up. There was the blast of a diesel locomotive's horn. An SB freight going north was crawling through. Standing there, with my father bearing down on me, and with no time to run further to the highway and hope for someone to pick me up, I had no other choice. I had to get out on this freight train. The first boxcar I saw had an open door, I decided to take it, ran full tilt besides the open door and tossed my pack inside. Then it was my turn. My hands closed around the lip of the boxcar door, and in that rush of adrenaline, I pushed up with all my might, then rolled in. I'd made the catch! Just in time, too, as the train accelerated and I watched the figure of my father grow smaller and smaller until he fell off the world completely. Needless to say, I never returned home that day or in the years after. Something ignited within my soul that day, I'm not entirely sure quite what. Maybe it was the excitement of my flight from my father, or maybe it's the sting that I still have of remembering my escape. Could I have fixed the relationship with my father? With Deborah? I can't get you a definite answer for that, probably not. Could I shut out those memories? I could, but why would I throw away perfectly good learning moments? Like that British Columbian trucker, I've got a burden to keep them alive. I have to keep them alive. They are muddied by three straight decades of spending my time in different worlds, sure. The world of paper shuffling and coughing in an office, the world of passing emotionless faces that I watched as I stood on the side of a highway. The world of the freight cars dominoing as the SB local gets underway, rolling out of town, and the sheer exhilaration I get, wrenching away from the railroad policeman's grasp and hopping on, just in time. But, as the saying goes, the beauty of the road is that it leaves you with nothing to lose and everything to give. Not too long after I left Woodland Forever, I encountered my first hobo jungle. It was located in the timbers on the border between Washington and Idaho. You see, I was run off by a bull earlier that day from a crew change spot on the Burlington Northern, and dusk was coming down fast. There was no way I was going to spend that night next to the tracks waiting for a red-eye freight to come through, so I went about trying to find a place just far enough away from the tracks to bunk down but close enough to easily pack up and get running in the morning. Fortunately, I didn't have to look long as soon as I spotted the faint flicker of a fire and low voices talking behind a grove of trees. As I started walking like the idiot I was, 
snapping dead branches and crunching over leaves, the voices stopped. Imagine the incredulous looks on their faces when I finally crashed through the brush into the campfire light, wearing a leftover scout camp shirt and looking like I just wandered off the wilderness survival course. They must have been expecting a bull and had pulled out their weapons in anticipation. A wooden spear, pocket knives, switchblades, hell, one of them even had a collapsible hunting rifle aimed directly at my head. In all my years since, I've seen folks carry pity little pocket pistols and sawed off shotguns, even a carbine once, but it takes true dedication to carry a full length rifle with you for protection. He's just a kid, one of them said. He was a weathered, weary old man with a battered straw hat. Are you a hopper? To which I replied, yes. And that was all it took. Weapons were slipped back into pockets and the spear and rifle leaned back against a tree. Before I could protest, they ushered me down on a log around the fire and loaded a plate up with potato and sausage hash, all the full fixins, and told me to eat up. The taste of that hash would be forever seared into my memory. Strands of potatoes, crisped by the skillet and the tender, flavorful fat that coated the sausage. To this day, it's still my favorite dish to make. Why are you doing this? I asked the old man in the straw hat after another guy slipped into our camp, bringing with him a loaf of sourdough bread he swiped from Spokane. I got my own food. Save it for your further travels, kid. He replied, a young guy like you need more calories than us old men. Say, how did you end up here anyhow? It spilled out of me. I must have spent a whole hour telling a group of high rollers, junkies, mental war dumpies, codified vagabonds, and probably a murderer or two about the truck driver, his ex and his daughter, Deborah and the bum, and last, my father, expecting that they would laugh and call me stupid for doing the things I did. But they didn't. My own pa was like yours, except worse, one of them said, and spat a wad of tobacco into the fire, wiping the juice from his beard with a ragged sack coat sleeve. He beat my sister and me senseless when he drank too much, and that's why while my sis lopped off with some fling, becoming a maiden of the road, I dug in too deep with my pa's anger and enlisted in the army to fight the Germans. Gave them hell, they returned the favor. He proceeded to lift his right pant leg, revealing a big chunk missing out of his thigh. You know, kid, he continued, what's funny about the road is that it leaves you with nothing to lose and everything to give. So I'd say screw that gal, Deborah. Your father, too, if it comes to that. They should have realized how good they had it before you dipped out of there. He angrily trampled the spark that had strayed from the fire and slunk off into the night to nods of approval from everyone staying by the fire. If his words were any indication of the future, the flame, the wanderlust in my heart became a blazing inferno, as fierce as the brush fire I witnessed while riding topside on a grain hopper through rural Tennessee. Through the last of the 80s till about mid-2010, I traveled all over on all modes of transportation mostly train hopping and hitchhiking the interstates and main lines ran deep into my blood and to make money to keep doing and I've taken up so many jobs from spending months working on a fishing crew in Alaska to a half day gig as a soup cook in New York City. During that time I keep learning a universal truth and it's this. Just like the folks that abandoned this truck, folks are too quick to throw good things away. Instead of just a truck or food like Deborah did, it's the experiences, memories, people that we waste. I once got a job, a good well-paying temporary job, in a popular ice cream shop located in downtown San Francisco. Name of the place slips me now. My co-workers, college kids, they despised the owner, Rob, I believe that is his name. They wrote him off as a cranky old geezer and put up morbid jokes on their MySpace pages about him, saying that they wished he could die sooner so they'd inherit his shot. They made those same remarks behind his back almost loud enough for him to hear. Rob was grumpy, sure, but he didn't really deserve it, at least compared to the more horrible bosses I've worked with. The Nanuet liquidation warehouse manager comes to mind. The real reason why Rob was so bitter to the world was because his wife had passed away a year before, leaving him alone to deal with it all. He knew about the shenanigans that went on, but was powerless to stop it. He actually asked me once to help him stop them in exchange for a raise. 
But since I was trying to line up another job working part-time at a seafood restaurant, I turned him down. I wish I took him up on his request. One particular evening, he never showed up to the shop to check on us like he always did. Turned out that he had passed away from a heart attack in front of his apartment that night. It seemed like everyone had a change of heart. They were posting pathetic, blatant lies about how much they loved him as a person, the sacrifices that he had made to start the business, all that stuff. Just like what happened as I listened to the British Columbian truck driver story and saw Evelyn's scar. Like when I helplessly watched as Deborah taunted and wasted a good bag of food in front of a starving man, I felt sick to my stomach. Sick and angry. Sick at my coworkers for talking crap, wasting their chance to help someone out. Angry at myself for blowing my own opportunity to help. Needless to say, I did the only thing I could do, and that was to run. Soon, I found myself stowing away on a ferry across the bay to Alameda, and then watching out the boxcar door, the moonlight playing across the waters of the Carnicus Strait as I caught the Union Pacific freight bound for Sacramento. It's those little things, the things we do and then say that tick me off, set my soul ablaze, ripped me from what little roots I had and swung me about to see the world all over again. Now, to the young folks reading this, is this what made you hit the road? Figured it as such. It's the same cycle that leads us to break out. Vanity and selfishness magnified these days by your Instagram, Facebook, or something. People wasting their lives getting their constant fix of euphoria injected by a few pieces of code making things such as money, looks, and status seem like an excuse to hurt and cast each other aside. The defenseless, the outsiders, even old friends, people are unable to see how just a little work would keep things all together. Like the clerk at Penderson and Sons who struck off this truck in 2003 because of a bad carburetor and expired tags. It doesn't surprise me anymore. Maybe it's a little different than I thought. Maybe to be given something. We have to lose something. Ah, what else is there to say? Oh, right. I woke up this morning to find my throat locked up in gunk produced by the doxorribicin that the doctors gave me for the mass in my thyroid. While I was hunched over the sink, hacking it out, I had an epiphany. Look, I ain't gonna lie to you. The life of a tramp is hard way harder than books and movies make it out to be. It takes guts, it really does, to hitch rides with total strangers and cash freight trains on the fly, and god forbid if it's in bad weather. Times have definitely changed since the day I left the road. Folks simply aren't doing it much anymore. Everyone's driving now and rarely stopping to pick us up at that. The old timers? They're dwindling, if not gone completely. Most of them caught the train westbound years ago or are simply rocking in a chair in front of a hospice window, shedding a tear, remembering their old buddies go by. Those hobo jungles, bustling with folks going every which way in that, gone the way they came, just a patch of grass by the tracks now. People have moved on. I've moved on. But that's not to say I'm not proud of you, kid. You broke out to run free like I did all those years ago with Deborah and my father. Much like a lot of the world nowadays, the truck's a testament to what could have been. A long list of if only. If only we put in the work to make it last. If only we held it close to our hearts and appreciated the importance of the men that drove it, the people that they carried, the families that they kept afloat. If only we could find the right person who would keep it running for us until the end of its days. If only we knew how to fix things before they fell forever into disrepair. If only we could tell and keep the story, even if it were only to share with the stars. If only we kept it on the road. Of the Archives by Dr. Everett Mann You wrote asking about the archives. First, let me start off with this. Do not enter the archives. It is a terribly dangerous place, and you are by no means ready for it. You are too inexperienced and impulsive to survive more than an hour or two at the most. Keep to the safer parts of the library, the children's section, perhaps. Still, perhaps some descriptions of various entities and locations will sate your curiosity. 
The black dog is a creature held in the archives. It is a thing of snapping jaws and teeth, burning eyes and claws, of howls and growls and baying. It is all the things you fear in dogs, and nothing else. You should never encounter it, since you should never be in the archives, and it should never leave the room in which it is held. If you do, then you have made some very poor choices, and I have little sympathy for you. The manticore is a very clever, very dangerous creature, extremely knowledgeable. However, it is in the business of secrets. It will share some of its secrets in exchange for secrets of yours. Be aware, though, that it will know if you are lying. Again, ideally you will never encounter it, but it does have a desire to escape, so the possibility exists that you will find it through no fault of your own. Speak politely, speak quickly, and speak carefully. Never forget that its name means man-eater. In far-off lands, its name is Bujum. The printer's devil captured in Mexico. He has well earned his damnation, and may the world burn before he leaves his cell. Carcosa is held in that fevered head, waiting to be released. If you encounter him, hold him. He is only a man, and less than the sum of his words. Bears. Many, many bears. Several wandered in a few years ago, and they've kept on ever since. They were a nuisance for a while, but they've developed nicely, and are almost useful. The Dawsons take care of them, and seem rather fond. They breed rather well, but something is keeping their numbers down. The boiler men are generally found only in the archives tending to the boiler, as their name suggests. They are still fairly human in shape, though piled down with heavy leathers that may or may not be a part of them. Their left hand, or sometimes their right, is replaced with a large scoop shovel, which is used to move coal and raw words into the furnace. Rather than mouths, they have a metal grill which takes in the coal dust that seems to sustain them. Leviathan is bound by silver chains in an ocean that is both smaller and greater than the one from which it was caught. I am confident you will never encounter it outside of the archives, because, if you have, it is free, and it will have shaken apart the foundations of the world. Keeping it held is one of the library's lesser purposes. If you find yourself in the archives, there are a few safe places. One of these is Xenadu. The stately pleasure dome exists within the library. I do not know if it owes its existence to Coleridge, or if Coleridge was somehow inspired by the archival version, but it matches his description closely. If you make it there, you should be safe until a Dawson can find you. Watch out for flashing eyes, however. If you should, somehow, wander into a genre, do not be alarmed. It is a pantomime. The people are stock shadows. Cowboys in western towns, private detectives going through the motions in noir mires, and gaudy heroines in mawkish romances. Ignore them. Why these useless pastiches exist, I could not even begin to guess. It is possible that someone created them, though someone wanting such a spectacle boggles even my imagination. There is, somewhere in the farthest reaches of the archives, an old, dull-skinned serpent. Not that serpent. Nor, on the other hand, the one you might have wanted it to be. This serpent will poison the sky and kill the son of the gods when the world ends, after dying itself. In the meantime, it waits in the archives. It is not a prisoner, in so far as it does not care to leave before time. It does not know that its ending has been unwritten, and for its own sake, we shall not tell it. It enjoys reading French poetry. The librarians have their own quarters somewhere in the archives, the docents and pages at least. The archivists do not, so far as I am aware, sleep. I have never seen these chambers, however, and know of them purely from speaking with pages. They are either well hidden or else purely inaccessible. Occasionally, you might find a parcel of them moving onwards towards work. Only the more senior of their number are encountered singly, and only in places where they feel safe. I have no idea what they're on guard against, but it should be yet another reason not to go wandering the archives. You will, of course, have noticed the clock above the archivist's desk in the library proper. 
It is run by a great quantity of clockwork. There is a great chamber full of giant chains and gears and cogs, and whatever else you call that collection of mechanical clutter. It's terribly easy to lose an arm in there, or find yourself crushed. While it all moves, no one has ever heard the bell at the top chime. I once climbed up and attempted to strike the bell physically. However, I found I could make no sound no matter how hard I swung my hammer. I could have made more sound hitting a mattress. The angel Jerachmiel is trapped inside a cage of star stuff, the beard of a child, and the sound of lost hope. She does not speak, but will write if you give him the materials. However, be aware that she is capable of lying if he thinks that it's necessary to do so. Do not trust her any further than you have to. He has motivations beyond mere escape. I suppose by this point we can throw away the pretense. If you're reading this far, you've disregarded my advice and you're in the archives. It's not difficult to get there after all. Getting out is more difficult. From where you are, go to the card catalog. Any librarians in the place should be able to show you where it is. You will know you are in the right place from the vast quantity of filing cabinets. You will have a sense that you are watched. This is likely from the archivist's field of vision. They use this room to track the books under their care. From here, you'll want to go through the green door. This will lead into the origami room. Be careful of paper cuts. Everything, from the trees to the furniture to the birds flying around, is made of folded paper. If you unfold anything, you'll find something or other written on it. The furniture tends to show plans, while the birds are sheet music, except for the eagle owl, which is Cardenio. Don't spend long. You never know what might be watching you. The next room will be filled with candles. Watch for dripping wax and shade your eyes. The room is just a hair above pleasantly warm. How the smoke makes its way out is beyond me, but unimportant. Carefully, so as not to ignite yourself, make your way to the red door with the number 3 carved on it. There is another red door in the room, but it does not have a number. Make sure you are going through the correct one. You do not want to get lost. There are, as I have stressed repeatedly, dangers in the archives. Now you'll find yourself surrounded by insects, wasps specifically. Don't worry, their stings are gone, replaced with nubs. If one lands on you, it might write something down. Take no mind. Their warnings are stuff and nonsense, and their poetry is doggerel. Just keep following my directions. Dig around the paper on the floor until you find a manhole. Descend quickly, you haven't much time. Now you will be in a sewer. As the smell will doubtless inform you, it runs with acetone, not the more organic waste you might have expected. Do not fall in unless you are particularly fond of chemical burns. You can hear it now, can't you? The baying, the growls, just a room or so behind you. I could pretend I didn't know it would turn out this way, but we're past the time for lies. I'm sorry. I want to live too. But I can give you a chance. I only promised to bring you to it. I never promised it would catch you. At this point, you're probably in the ink room. Take the pen from the pot. Pour it out. There. There's a door. Ignore the garden. Open the door. Push past the birds. Ignore them and say the name of your father and the door is open. Keep moving. Ignore the breath on your neck. Yes, you're now on a cloud, but keep moving. New doors open, keep pushing through. Don't stop to play poker, he can't help you and doesn't intend to. Next room, you're going to want to stop to clean. That is an effect of the table. Ignore it and push on. Now, you're in a room with concrete walls and broken pieces of rebar. Books impaled on them, be careful not to injure yourself. Look at the bloody prints on the floor. I'm sorry. I lied. You won't get out of this. I want to live too. It Always Rains by Stygian Blue It was a beautiful day for a storm. 
It was one of those rare November days where the wind was strong and the rain was cold, when it perpetually felt like everything outside was but a precious few hours away from boiling over into a monsoon, or a hurricane, or something like that. I never paid much attention to the weather. The rain poured. I stayed inside. The concrete in the parking lot was still bent from the summer heat. I could see it from my window, a sea of frozen waves and whirlpools, captured on a canvas as black as the oil that made it. I wondered if it would ever melt back into shape. I felt like it should because I had always been told that concrete did that. But part of me felt like it never really happened, that I just forgot to check the warps and whirls before the heat came back and I inevitably rushed outside only to see more bends and curves and cursed my forgetfulness. But how else will I know for sure? A washed pot will boil eventually, but not if the fire isn't lit. If I can't see the fire, how will I know that it will boil? The rain pounded against the windows and the roof. I lived at the top floor of the dorms, a most undesirable place for anyone else. Far from classes, far from friends, and hard on the legs if the elevators were out of service, which they always were. But I never had a hard time getting up. Sometimes I slip up, ask someone where their horns are, why they aren't flying, how they can't see the fairies in that tree when the second sun will set today, and they will look at me strangely. I've always been able to laugh, brush it off, discourage doctors from prescribing me medicines that I don't need, but the comments made me an outsider, even in college, a place where others always say that there are no outsiders, that everyone is weird, and nobody is alone. The rain lashed down harder, and I looked up from my book to the window, absently placed it on a shelf that wasn't there. The book sat there, in thin air, for a moment. I felt it do so, even though I wasn't watching it, and then it quietly disappeared. I looked back from the rain-streaked window, a beautiful nonsense of colored panels depicting something that was probably either religious or academic to check if the book was still there. It wasn't. In its place, hanging in the air as though by invisible threads, though there never were any, was a tiny glass scorpion, exquisitely crafted. It shone in the cloud-weak sunlight, its pincers glittering as it twisted and turned, looking for ground. I took it from the air, carefully making sure to hold it by its tail, as its pincers were small, and I had heard somewhere that the small clod had the most potent venom, and placed it in a drawer. I exhaled. This is how it has always been. I used to try convincing people that what they could see was not all there was, that there were shelves of some monstrously large libraries surrounding us all, and only I could feel them. Sometimes they blocked hallways and I had to squeeze through the gaps where books were to be placed. But I was a child back then, and everyone were much more upfront than they would be today that they could not see what I could. My parents did not see my behavior for anything but creativity, quickly forgetting any mention I made of the library. But despite everyone's denial, I knew. The rain was a downpour, a torrential ocean coming down to earth. Sometimes people say that the sky is raining buckets, and this was the only time I had seen that to be true. There was more water than air out there, and for a brief moment, I saw a fish. And everyone else did too. And that's all I have for you today. Come, you look. What's the word? Ah, sleepy. Have my stories bored you such? No, no, I just... It's quite alright. You little things need your rest. Hop off, this is the place. Wonderful, isn't it? A nice little nest to cozy up in. Go on and drift off. When you wake up, you'll be able to find your way back to the main hall. Just... Pick a direction and start walking. Until then, good night, wanderer. Restful dreams.